Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Looking Deeper with Sandy Herrick and yours truly. Hey, Sandy, how are you? I've got a mouthful of mac and cheese. I'm a happy child. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good day here for pasta, too. It's quite uh, rainy and chilly outside. Oh, my God. Well, it's cooled off, and I haven't had mac and cheese since I can't remember. So it's like, get it to me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Comfort food. Oh, we need some comfort food. We need comfort food. Oh. All well, right. Yeah, let, let's get to it. Let's get to it. For all of you that are out there listening to us at this moment, the chat room is open. So come on in. Uh, the water is warm. And uh, Sandy and I are looking forward to tonight's conversation about age and wisdom and knowledge and confident humility. Confident hey, Holly. humility? Yep. Confident humility. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. What would you describe that as being, actually? Confident humility? Mm -hmm. um, that's when you know that, for me personally, confident humility is knowing that it's in our humility. Our humility doesn't have to be loud, right? I'll, we come to a point, or I've come to a point, where I don't have to be overly loud about everything, um, I'm confident in who I am and what I've experienced in my life. And I'm confident about what those experiences have taught me about some things. And I don't have to shout that from the rooftops. Right. I'm just confident in keeping it sometimes close to the vest. Right. Um, and at the same time, readily admitting that I don't know it all. Right. And I never will. Right. Right. It's it's a it's a it's a fascinating paradigm in confident and humble and and that you're not underly or overly modest. So I'm starting to belch wow, so there's work here. And I wanna say for myself, you know, when I hear you say it and I sit in my own age, I sit in the acquired life I sit and it's not just I'm sitting here now it's I'm sitting through the phases of knowing where all of a sudden that confidence came where I don't have to upstage or reset something or um, if something is said I don't have to go and reconfirm it or um, steal the show or compete I think company humility is something in me is not competitive. I participate without being um, combative. <clears throat> that I don't have to self-defend. That's a great way I'm to put it. it. Mm -hmm. So when I hear that confident humility, there is a space of I'm self-protected so I don't embarrass easily and I don't need to be flattered easily I can I can un, I, you know someone can tell me I'm great and that's great but that doesn't make my reality better or worse it's certainly flattering and someone can tell me I'm a bad crap and I know well maybe that is so for them and I'm a human being and I've done a lot of crappy things but they're part of my resources mm -hmm. and even be humble about the fact that Living is hard, and we only learn great lessons the hard way. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we put that into the um, the topic for tonight. Yeah, becoming okay. humble and what makes us humble, and where yeah. do we get? You know, how do we get to that place where you just know what you know? You don't have to shout it from the rooftops. You don't have to try to be better than the next person. You just you simply know what you know, and you come to realize that you don't know as much as maybe you think you knew <laughs> about certain things. Some people know more. Um, and I think also in the confident humility is understanding uh, those times when we encounter somebody who they themselves thinks they know more than they know. 
And we're confident enough in our own humbleness to understand that they simply don't know or it's their own lack of age and um, understanding. And that it'll come. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. I remember one time being uh, out on the reservation and I went to ceremonies with a young medicine man. And he was really obnoxious, just obnoxious. And afterward, we were in his home eating a meal. And my sister, Della, bad wound, uh, was sitting uh, at the table. And again, he started off a conversation with all this bravado and going on with immense ego. And I was literally biting my tongue and he was sitting with Della and myself, and she looked at me and said, remember, sister, he's really young. One day, he'll know what you and I have lived a lifetime to come to know. Wow. And obviously, I've never forgotten that. Right. But that, she was being very humble. She wasn't correcting him. She wasn't making him feel bad. She, in her confidence, and as an elder, he looked at her, and it set him back a bit. Really? And I could see the wheels turning. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's this place inside me with um, also a humility of, and I know that there are places where my humility catches me, or I'm I'm humbled by a moment. Mm -hmm. I can honestly say it's something that I have, but it's something that happens to me. I don't think I'm a humble person, per se. I mean, I think everybody that knows me would agree. (laughs) I think I have a bold ego. I'm out there. But there's a dignity when I need to have my own dignity and there's also when I'm humble it's it's by things that touch me deeply or when something is so honest before me I need to shut up so that it can be present to many even to me I like that why just in listening to you share those words it's like I had a a reel of experiences that are the personification of what you're talking about in those moments that are so pristine in rawness or the, yeah, the rawness of being human or the rawness of human uh, interaction with spirit or the rawness of the fact that spirit is real right? in the moments of being awestruck Right. There's, there's, there's so many places where dignity and humility and wisdom, I mean, because we want to bring wisdom in here, you know, they say out of the mouth of babes, there are children that have wisdom out of the simplicity of the simple fact that they are not intoxicated yet with outside information right? or they're not deemed less than because someone told them they can't be who they are. Mm -hmm. And there's a real beauty for me to know when a child just kind of hits it on the mark and we're awestruck with the fact they really are watching Mm -hmm. and their minds truly have observation that is sane and caring. I can be humble with a ch- humbled by a child. Mm-hmm. I like the fact that children have wisdom and kind of lose it <laughs> uh-huh. because of hormones. Everybody does. But I like that for me that. I had, I was born with a natural wisdom inside me 
Dana, that I know and knew I could rely on. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just kind of there. It doesn't mean that I'm a wise person. I just had that innate observation to see. Mm -hmm. I still had to grow. I still had to learn. I still had, to, you know, we can, we can have a lot of insight and where do we use it? How does it benefit us? Sometimes it's a hazard. I, I would, I think there are times I would like to have been really like, not know what I know, so I could have gotten away with more. <laughs> uh huh. <coughs> Any thoughts on that? <coughs> well, because what I'm hearing you say and what it means to me is self checking and being radically aware of. Um, Being radically aware. Of repercussions of. All of it. There's, you know, where do we find the wisdom? Is it through the glorious events or is it through experiencing a hardship or I mean, let's use to, let's use the past few days. God bless everybody in Texas. God bless everybody in Buffalo. The wisdom of this is what's happening now, or this is what is in our lives now mm -hmm. is very shocking and sad. Mm -hmm. It's insulting as a human being to know that this is happening. Mm -hmm. For me, as an elder, I qualify as an elder to know that my generation was a generation that was supposed to bring peace along with the drug, sex, and rock and roll. And it really happened, but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it happened in phases and it's been, it, now it's, 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 there's a whole other phrase. And the wisdom is for me, history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. The wisdom is everything is always in transition and that we can be surprised in ways that says, we can never let down our guard and think that everybody wants peace. Mm -hmm. If there's anything I'm going to say from that place of wisdom for me today is the shock of realizing no matter how much we would like to have peace or say we want peace, not everybody wants peace. No, they don't. And not everybody cares if you have your peace or your peace of mind, or you find a peaceful place to be. They really don't care. Yes, and there are those people that don't care anything outside of their own personal self. Exactly. <clears throat> so because I always work in that psychological place of healing and observation and transformation, it, it becomes necessary to to educate from that place of wisdom or knowing that if I have a theme, if I have a, um, well, you were very honest today. Um, I want to, you know, kind of like, you know, you and I had a talk and it's wonderful to offer prayers. It's wonderful to put people in the light, but when does action take place also? When does the rubber meet the damn road? Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. And, <clears throat> and the wisdom is how do we find ourselves? What do we do about it? And to know that there are um, wishing something doesn't necessarily make it happen. Uh huh. There has to be some interaction. Yes. And because you don't get your wish doesn't mean that God didn't love you. 
And just because you get your worst, it doesn't mean God loves you more. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, maybe there's wisdom in a lot of the, um, I think there's a lot of things on uh, <clears throat> Facebook right now that are starting to sound a bit more wise than whimsical. <laughs> I like that more wise than whimsical. There's been a lot of whimsical new age, fought a lot, peace. I mean, I'm not making insult. Mm -hmm. It's it's like something's, something's activating us <clears throat> to get more real rather than just hopeful. Well, and, and right. And one of the, the things that I've learned in all of my years of part of, you know, aging and wisdom, well, several things um, that have really given me amazing insight into humanity. And one of them, one of the things that I've learned along the way is that every voice counts. <clears throat> and sometimes it is the most humble of people from the most humble of situations, conditions, um, you name it who become the lone voice and that lone voice becomes a group of voices and then it becomes a tidal wave and it becomes the voice of change with humble beginnings. And I've also learned in my life that the most giving people that I've ever met in my life are the people that we think have the least and yeah. we might say have the least amount of financial resources or the least amount of extra time on their hands. It's been my experience that the people who are the most humble are the ones that very discreetly and humbly give of their time, their resources, their wisdom, their compassion, the biggest givers are not the ones that are out shouting, look at what I gave. Right. And the ones that are moving mountains aren't the ones out shouting, look at what I did. Right. Right. They're the ones who help lift others up to the highest potential of themselves and help them to understand that it takes a village, it takes a community, it takes sometimes a tidal wave, but that every right. everything, every person matters, every voice, every thought and they don't all have to be the same voice or the same thought. For me, that that has, has given me a lot of wisdom. When did you start to experience that? I started to experience that um, really started to experience it 16 years ago when I started the work with Gathering Thunder before it became a 501c3. And um, noticing that the most generous people with their wisdom, their time, their teachings, their money have always been the most humble and sometimes the people that I would least expect. Right. And I've learned that the people with the biggest bump in their gums are typically the ones that are just blowing smoke. Not always, but a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, today I made a post on Facebook with regard to calling um, governmental representatives about gun violence. And, you know, I, I received some messages, <clears throat> messages sidebar from people that um, were like really surprised that I would put something like that out on social media and I forget that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that I learned a long time ago that every one of us counts and what we feel and what we think does matter. And so it's not foreign to me to call the ASPCA. I've got their number in my phone, the right. ASPCA in Detroit that oversee horses, right? right? Or going up to Standing Rock. 
or my work with Gathering Thunder. I've been catching flack for my work with Gathering Thunder for 16 years from people who don't understand why I do what I do. Right. Um, and you know what? I was raised by a Vietnam veteran in a military household. And when you're raised by a Vietnam veteran, it's, it, there was a time when that wasn't a very popular thing. No. Um, so it's not foreign to me to call any congressperson, senator, governor regarding adoptee uh, rights, animal rights. I, and I do that, you know, Native American rights, all of those sorts of things. I've been doing it for years and years and right. years and years. What, what prompted you to do it? initially? Well, I have always had a weakness or a soft spot for elderly people, children, and animals. I have always, that that is my kryptonite. Mm -hmm. And I find it easier for myself to speak up on behalf of others than I do for myself. And I've watched, whether it's the work at the foundation or even the last time I called the ASPCA in Detroit about um, somebody who has horses, it wasn't because I thought I was better than them or I know better I understand in my years of living on this earth that sometimes people just don't know any better. And the last time that I called the ASPCA about a horse owner, what I witnessed was the horse owner for the very first time getting automatic watering systems for their horses. Oh, wow. And building shade lean-tos for their horses. And getting round bales of hay in the winter. And I watched the improvements and I've, I've learned that sometimes people, depending on their circumstances, just don't know any better. I remember one time somebody saying to me, why is it out on the reservation that they can't even clean up their yards? They have junk cars and car parts and pieces out in their yards. Can't they even pick up their garbage? And I looked at the person and said, how do you think they get spare car parts? <laughs> Do you think they just run into Napa and Rapid City and get some auto parts? Right. And they looked at me and said, oh, I never thought of it that way. Right. I'm really embarrassed that I said that. Wow. So sometimes I'm a purveyor of providing humility. <laughs> right. As much as I am somebody who, <laughs> yeah, right, who right. Uh, gains humility. Right. And to offer humility, you know, it's, it's there, that is that giving information and offering information is offering the opportunity for someone to become humble rather than judgmental. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Information helps rather than insult. Yes. Laura Smith is in the chat room and she's saying you have to be a voice for those who don't have one. It's true. It's true. And Holly is saying, I feel the need to speak for my female ancestors who didn't have the freedom to do so. I can feel them when I vote. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've worked. I, I think the way that you have done your foundation work and whatnot, I've participated a little bit, but where I, where I have always stood in my shoes with the underdog, it's not something I decided to do. It's something I found out I do. And that is to take a child out of somebody's hand that is dangerous to them. Mm -hmm. To, and, and literally do it. Mm -hmm. To um, call the police when there's, there's trouble. Mm-hmm. To you know, to to you know, get help, mm -hmm. and 
answer questions later. Right. Um, I mean, literally, I was in bed one night and I heard the woman next door being thrown around and went in and got her. Wow. As the man was like yelling at me, it's like, you, you don't want to fuck with me. Mm-hmm. And, and, and things like that. It's, it's amazing how even when I was married to report abused children, which was in my family, you know, on my, on my husband's side. And it's, it's like that place of when you know that there's someone who can't defend themselves, Mm -hmm. when you know that someone is overpowered, when I see that there is, um, an injustice, Mm -hmm. I mean, even with animals, you know, yeah. I've reported animals. I've, I, I, I mean, I've broken up dog fights. Mm-hmm. I, it's, 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 I mean, I, I think I'm a little crazy because there's actually, I've pulled dogs off of dogs. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, you will not take this dog down. And it, it has that place of, I don't know if that's, that's wise what I'm feeling is that what we're talking about is how do we intercept when there is something helpless, naive, or just doesn't know better. Right. And doesn't know how to either defend themselves Mm -hmm. or get for themselves. And to, it's not to be, and I, and I, I, it's, it's amazing. Um, I was at a car accident once and I got to take care of everybody. I got everybody out of the car. I got everybody to the side of the road. I made sure everybody was safe. And the police came and da da da. And at the end of everything, when the car was taken off to the side of the road and everybody was shuffled off, the police came up to me and said, We're going to take you to the hospital. And I looked at them and I said, Why? And they said, Because you're in shock. Mm-hmm. But it was because I was in shock, I was able to do all that stuff. Right. And it kind of comes to what happens with when we're in shock at what reality is or what we see before us. Mm -hmm. It affects us in a way that either repels us or brings us to it. Right. It also can make us stand still Mm -hmm. because we can't believe what's happening. We freeze. Yes. And that wisdom gets developed with, oh, wait a second, something, intelligence has to enter here. Yeah. And I really feel that, you know, I was just gifted that word, intelligence, that something intelligent steps in. And in that intelligence, it's not about who's right or wrong. It's about something needs to be made safe something needs to be brought back to sanity. Yes. Yes. And the humility, the humility is, is the humility for me says, I don't have all the answers, but maybe together we can get, we can get something done. Maybe we all have a part of the answer. Well, that's a gathering of intelligence. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and, and see, that just brought the goosebumps to me. It's like, I know I don't know a lot, but I also know I know a lot. But I, what I love, really love, is to be within circle and to be inspired to think. Yes. When we teach, I get inspired to think. Mm-hmm. When we have our shows, I get inspired to think. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the kind of person that I know how to binge really easily <laughs> or to fade away or put the top down and dry. And it's, 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 it's humane for me to be able to sit down and have a conversation or a discussion and find out what even I'm thinking. Mm-hmm that a question would bring up that makes me think or makes me discover that there's something inside me Mm -hmm. that wants to be expressed, needs to be expressed, or now needs to be released. Yes. And offered. Or stand up for. Yes. 
And along all of those lines, I think one of the, the greatest wisdoms of the modern age, the current age, and I think more people are finally understanding that the friends that you have on Facebook, well, some of them are your friends, but 95% of your friends on Facebook, they are not your friends. They are people you choose to interact with outside of your friendships and family and colleagues. And so the quest to have the most friends on Facebook or the, oh my God, I don't want to say that on Facebook because I might upset somebody. Oh, what will they think? With age and wisdom, you come to understand they're not even thinking about you. No. They don't think about you when they go to bed at night. They don't no. think about you when they get up in the morning. They may think about you for a few minutes if you put something on Facebook that's a little juicy or what have you. Um, but then they don't think about you again. But you do come to understand that our confidence doesn't have to be boastful. It's a knowing that, you know, this morning I put out uh, phone numbers for those that live in Kent County, Michigan, like I do, all the way through the state up to, you know, our federal government, phone numbers to call about gun violence and or all of the associated tentacles related to what results in gun violence. And I was moved to do that because it's one of those understandings that I know that there are people who are waiting for the okay. Well, if Denise puts that out there and she's got the phone numbers and she says she's making phone calls, then, you know, I feel like maybe I have the, the, the strength to do that or the courage to do that today because I'm not alone. At least she's with me. They had my hands in the air. After I talked mm. to you, I went and Googled the people and posted it as, here's who you call. Exactly. Exactly. Like, you know, wait a second. I don't have to sit here and mumble and grumble. So I appreciate you for telling me what you were doing. And it's like, <laughs> you know, you're right. I mean, you know, it's it's like, yeah, I'm exhausted. Yeah, I'm shocked. And you know what? I'm not grieving the loss of a personal family member today. Exactly. But so, I can speak up for the people that are grieving. Exactly. And, you know, here, you, well, when we were speaking, I was with Easton. And right. <clears throat> here he is, two and a half years old. And I, before you called, I sat him down and I said, look, Easton. And he's looking at me. Yes, Grandma. <laughs> I said, something is happening in this country. And Grandma is going to be making some phone calls. And I'm going to be calling beginning with Senator Debbie Stabenow. And he's just looking at me like, what are you talking about? And then can we go outside? <laughs> oh, <wise right>? woman. <laughs> yeah. But I explained to him what I was doing and why. I know he's two and a half, but I also know that he's a sponge. And in his psyche, he right. will remember grandma is one of those people who makes the phone call. And I did. I had just gotten done. I had just completed a phone call with the senator's office just before you and I spoke, before I moved right. on to Congress people. Um, but I explained it to him. And if my putting that out there allowed one person to say, well, hey, at least I'm in the canoe with her. I'm going to paddle with her. I didn't tell people what to say or what not to say. But if you would like to say... Let's say it. No different exactly. than when I have my my Facebook backdrop is the missing and murdered indigenous women's billboard in that Grand Rapids. That was breathtaking. Yeah. And there are people who will sidebar me and say, why do you even care? These people don't live by you. Why do you, why do you care about any of that? Why so do let you... me ask you something. Let me ask you something. If you're yes. saying something, people say, why do you care? Yeah. I would like to know why they don't care. Thank you. That's where I was headed with all of this. Why don't you care? Exactly. And they people, you know, we're all on the grandmother earth together. Here we are on grandmother. We are in this together. 
I remember um, I put a post up one time that said all babies are, are all children are our children. And a woman put American children are our children. Wow. And it, and at first I was so saddened by that. But in my humility or in my understanding, I also know that because we may believe in something, it is not necessarily going to change anybody else's mind. Exactly. Maybe it's not supposed to. Right. But I will say that sometimes I've been humbled by another person's position that's opposite mine. Right. And it gets me to thinking. Right. And I think, holy crap, man. I never thought of it that way. Right. Have you ever had that? No. And, you know, <laughs> you have a very different affiliation with uh, orphanage and the lost child than I do. So, you know, your antlers are pointed in a very different type of dire direction. And your antennas are very highly strung there. And, you know, for me, it is the battered woman. Yeah. And it's that place of my experience of being a battered child, my experience of being a battered woman, that if I hear the sound of someone or if I know someone's in trouble um, or even in my counseling to be able to get somebody to, you know, stop allowing the abuse. And so there's that place where for me, it's, it's necessary to even tell a battered woman that she's being battered. Mm -hmm. And it's, or a child that's being abused that, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to go home. Right. We, we need to get it to a safer <clears throat> place. Yes. And it's that place for me where it, 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 it I mean, even talking about it, it kind of makes my teeth sharp. Mm -hmm. because there's that place of I am touched by how I've been touched. And that may be part of how we're all motivated, you know, in, you know, something that is personally experienced inside me. I understand something about it. Mm -hmm something that has personally I had to champion by myself or you know the first person I would rescue in my life was literally my sister the people my sisters and my brother and and it it was even fighting my father from stopping to hit us I mean fighting my father to stop hitting my siblings mm -hmm. and it, there's that place of a bravado and I say it in the way of my experience of you. You have a bravado that has the courage to say something because you're driven. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. But you do. Mm -hmm. And your passion comes from, in my experience, your experience. Yes. It's not that you lived well and didn't live well and, oh, I want to do this. It's you understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time that uh, <clears throat> I went to my sister Barbara's house for the first time and she and I were talking and she said, you know, you know, sister, you fit right in here on this reservation. You fit right in. And I said, why is that? And she said, because you don't look down on anybody. Right. And I said, well, you know, thank you for that. And I don't, I don't talk a whole lot about the way that I was raised or, you know, what I experienced. But I was, you know, my folks were really poor. And my kids, the first time that I told them that the first house that I lived in with my folks was literally a trailer that's smaller than the camper that Todd and I go camping in. And they laughed. And then Elise looked at me and said, oh my God, you're serious. Yeah. I never knew this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never knew this. Yes. Um, and there was another point in our um, life as a family where we lived a, uh, 
an entire summer in a camper at a KOA camp. Um, so for me, hum I, I come from very humble beginnings, very humble. And, you know, for some people, when they find that out, they're stunned. They're stunned by that. And every so, every so often, you know, life reminds me. Like when I, you know, as a lot of people know that I'm looking into getting my birth records unsealed. And in the process of that, I was going through some paperwork that uh, the Sarge gave me before he passed. And I found the purchase receipts for myself. There, there's two $50 receipts. <laughs> um, so I come from very humble beginnings. And... I appreciate, how do I want to say this? I appreciate the wisdom of people who come from a place of their wealth is not measured by their things, but their wealth is measured by their stories, is measured by their community, is measured by their love, is measured by their culture, and is measured by the experiences they've had in my life, in their life. Right. Does that make sense, Sandy? Well, it's more than makes sense. It represents the dignity of your life as a quality, because of the quality of human being you are, not the China you're eating off of mm -hmm. or the house you're living in. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything I've ever learned from my grandmothers when we were driving around and she would look at the houses uh, as she was in the, you know, the front car on the, the driver, the passenger side, and she would look at these houses and she goes, oh, good people must live there. And I remember being a child and asking why. She goes, because it's a pretty house. Mm. And if there's anything I learned, that <laughs> is not true. You got that right. And that if you went by, you know, what you're describing as a trailer or a trailer camp, my grandmother would have assessed you differently. Yes. And it's in my defense of her, it's her lack of knowing because of her impoverishment, mm -hmm. you know, what, what she's gone through. But still, it's that assumption that if you see something, you know something because you assess it by its cover. Yes. And I know a lot of really, really good-looking people that are really not worth too much other than their good looks. Right. And it's that place of, and, 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 I, and I don't want to get judgy. I really don't want to get judgy. Everybody's running their life the way they run their life. Right. And it's, it's like, but I do judge. <laughs> and I have to sit back and be more modest or humble about, you know, why am I judging? What makes me judge? What makes me criticize? What makes me fear? What makes me angry? What makes me competitive or jealous? I mean, I'm a Scorpio. I got an edge. Mm -hmm. And it's that it's that place of what makes me ambitious? What what make, what motivates me? I think if there's anything that I'm going to ask out of tonight is what really motivates me? And it's issues of the heart. Yes. It's just that simple. It's issues of the heart. Yes. I want people to feel... I want people to understand their feelings. I want people to have the right to feel. And I want people to feel safe so they can have their feelings and their values and their voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, I just heard myself say their values. I'm very judgmental about values right now. And I say that from that place of, my values are different than a lot of values that are calling themselves values mm -hmm. because they're screwing around with my values. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're taking away my human rights. They're taking away my dignity. They're taking away my privacy. They're taking away my sanctuary mm -hmm. or challenging it. 
And so what motivates me is, wait a second, I, I guess... I just kind of had this spin around in my chair, which, by the way, I have a, a new chair in my office, and I'm not quite comfortable in it yet because it's like my my other one was more comfortable and bigger, but it fell apart. And this one's kind of like my body doesn't know it yet. So uh-huh. I'm still here kind of figuring uh-huh. it out. Uh-huh. But it's like that place of... I'm a woman, first and foremost... And I'm a feral woman. I'm not a religious woman. I'm not a Christian woman. If anybody asks me, are you Christian? Well, if I believe in Jesus or trust that Jesus is around, yes. But I am not a Christian in that way of what is being deemed as Christian now and what Christianity stands for. I'm not. I'm a feral woman who believes in the heart who believes in respect and dignity and who believes in God and who believes in a honesty about self morality not about controlling it from some invisible thing I I I I I I, I, I we get dangerous here mm-hmm. <laughs> But that is also acquired wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's taken me a long time to be able to really quietly, broadly say, I'm a broad first. Truly. Mm -hmm. If you're going to come against me or come up or ask me anything, it's not what is my religion. It's this is this is this is my soul. What is my soul? Mm hmm. My soul is a woman who fights for women and children Mm -hmm. against any man, woman, or children that would deem them less than Mm -hmm. and take them for advantage. Mm -hmm. But I do say you have an activity inside you that is much bolder and louder and has a larger landscape than I do. Well, particularly when it comes to children, I I have um, a ferocity with that. You know, last night when I was watching <clears throat> the horror that was unfolding in Texas, in my mind, I thought here, on in one hand, I, along with many others, work so hard to make sure that you know, children get what they need. Uh, Native American children get what they need, whether it's school books or clothing or food or sometimes even a coffin, right? Hi. <clears throat> to help them sustain and to live and to preserve and to bring their light and anchor their light here on Grandmother Earth. And what is this darkness that is trying to create an imbalance in that, or to wipe it away. What is that darkness? What is the root of it? And so in my mind, exactly. What is that darkness? What is that spirit of darkness? Whatever you want to call that, that's trying to usurp the goodness. And when it comes to that sort of a conversation, that's when, you know, my spiritual hackles go straight up when it comes to defenseless children or old people who are going to the grocery store to buy a loaf of Wonder Bread or whatever. Um, and it last night when I was sitting in bed and I was thinking about all of these things, my one of my foster fathers or whoever he was in my life, he was a poet. And before I was rehomed, he wrote a poem for me, and I still have it. And the very last sentence of the poem that he wrote for me 
was whatsoever you do for the least of these. And I woke up this morning and that line, whatsoever you do for the least of these. And I thought, well, it's one of those days again where I'm being asked to do something. And this time it's not, hey, we need some tables at the children's home because they're too little to eat at the big table. I mean, I do that. <laughs> we do that at the foundation. We buy clothing. We do all of that. We need fresh fruit. Okay. Um, this time it was something needs to be done on a larger scale and your voice needs to be heard again. Mm -hmm. Because the voice of the darkness that is snuffing out and slaughtering, not killing, slaughtering, slaughtering. innocent people, um, that darkness needs to be dealt with. And thoughts and prayers ain't cutting it. No. And sending out pink bubbles of light ain't cutting it. <laughs> right. Right? That's like when Barbara says, well, the children need fresh fruit because it's really expensive now. And they don't have any more fruit. Well, I'll send thoughts and prayers and see if that fills their belly. Right. That's not what happens. Um, the horses that I'm looking at, um, some of them are actually dropping dead in the heat. Well, I'll send some thoughts and prayers and pink bubbles of light and see if that helps them with their situation. No, right. I call the ASPCA. Exactly. And I learned a lot of that, frankly, from the Sarge. Because he was a badass. Mm hmm he just was. He was a badass. And when you saw Vietnam, you <clears> saw <throat> the world in a very different degree of humanity than just sitting in America. Yes. When I saw the man that returned. Yeah. That's a different soul. It's a different soul. And you see what horror and war and the darkness does. Right. <clears throat> and Catherine Ladyhawk is in the chat and she's asking, how do you help the one that was used to do the harm? That's a great question. That's a great question. God. Sometimes I call them out on it. Yeah. If I know the person and I know they were being used as a pawn, I, I confront that. I've been known to do that. Sometimes you have to, you know, work with their family or what have you. Um, lots of different ways. What about you, Sandy? Well, it, it's a spectacular question. It is. And it's a question that I think goes along with the action. Yes. It depends on the action, Lady Hawk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start with, first and foremost, what I think is insane right now is that in Florida, you can't use the word gay, but in Texas, you can give an 18 year old a machine gun. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the insanity of how do you, how do you cultivate a mind that can decide that their arrogance is so incredibly harvested in some way that their grand gesture is to murder the epitome of innocence. Mm -hmm. That person to me or people like that to me, how do you, what do you do with them? It's, it's first and foremost, the wisdom would be first and foremost, contain them, get them, um, give them safety from themselves and from others if they're not killed. And I know that I do not have the sophistication, the ability, or even the, the, um, the need on mm -hmm. some level to be the person to care for them. But the way I would hope that they are cared for, and I mean it, 
is that they're deprogrammed because this person has been programmed in some way to believe this way and act this way and to produce the results of life in this way. It's, it's who's been talking to them. What have they been doing? Where's the mental illness? It's, Mm -hmm. it's not an easy thing that it's not cut and dry for me. No, it isn't. I agree with you on that. And it makes me stammer. So I want you to know, Lady Hawk, that this is a stymied reaction. I know that after speaking to Dana, it was like, well, I posted on Facebook. Here's, here's the art. Here's our government. You know, let's, let's, yeah, let's start calling. Right. I can't deal with these people, but I can talk to people that are dealing with these people mm-hmm. to deal with these people. Yes. I have, I've had to deal with difficult people. And for me, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a hair, it's a, it's a hair cutting. It's in the moment. It's mm-hmm. not a, it's not a theory that this is how it's done. And this is how you do it. It's like you find it out in the minute. In a second, in a, it, you, you, what do you do? You do what is necessary in the moment. Exactly. Well, and you know, when I say to somebody, hold the light, be the light, that is not a passive act. No, it's not. That's not like standing there, you know, like a lamp with a lampshade on. No. Holding the light, walking with the light, being in the light, shining your light. That is not passive. That is active. So the prayer that is activated, what is your prayer? Well, my prayer is, well, how do you activate that? And as Carla Joe is saying, how many people really stop and pray who say they're going to? <clears throat> well, we don't know that. But the most effective prayer is the prayer that is put into action. Moving with it, picking up the phone call, looking at our own selves in the mirror. Sometimes right. that's the prayer and the answer right. to it. I guess I better look at myself before I, you know, pick up the phone. Better, right. you know, have some self-reflection of your own, Chica. Sometimes that's the active part of it. But having the thoughts and the prayers is stagnant. It's like adding more green moss to the top of a stagnant pond. It's when you get that shit moving that things happen. Right. And there's that, you know, there are those that there's different levels of participation. And that's no different than any military who's on the front line and who's in the desk smoking a cigar. Yes. And, you know, where's the intelligence? Where's the brute? Right. Where's the strategy? Where's the chess players? I mean, everybody is kind of like, uh, I know I run into burning buildings. Mm-hmm. I know this. Yeah. But I also know that it's not a decision I make. I run to where the sound of danger is. I always have. Mm-hmm. And what I do in that moment isn't something I can explain that I have a routine in doing because I don't know what I'm going to find. But I know I'm available to see it. Yes. And with today, with what's going on today, I think what I want to say is I do not want to become detached from what's happening because it's so far away. Yes. And I don't want to say, uh, well, it's doing one thing or another. I'm saying we're fucking confused. Yeah. We're out of our minds confused by this. Mm -hmm. And that for me is why we don't know what to do yet. And we're trying whatever we can and there are people saying, it's not this, it's that, it's that, it's that. And I think what you're doing, Dana, is, you know, you're going to the people that do have the greater voice. Mm-hmm. And you're letting them know your voice. And, but we do have to start pushing back. Yes. At the insanity. Well, and sometimes, 
and we all know this, I think probably everybody who's listening, is that with wisdom comes the understanding that sometimes you have to go it alone. Yeah. You don't have your family behind you saying, yeah, you go, you do. You sometimes absolutely have to be by yourself, in your light, in your power, call it what you will. Because at the basis of who we all are, we know right and wrong. <clears throat> we know it. We can pretend we don't or we can put the lipstick on the pig, right? And right. say, well, that well, it looks pretty now. But in our humanity, we know. I mean, there are those, of course, who are mentally ill who, who don't quite understand that or don't understand at all. But what I'm saying is we all have our own moral compass. And right. sometimes that compass leads us on a path by ourselves. Right. And we have to be okay if the family doesn't like our comment on Facebook or love the comment on Facebook, or we have to be okay with that. And I think with age and wisdom, we do become okay with that. Right. And you understand there's going to be conflict. There's going to be opinion. Yes. There's going to be, there's going to be blowback. It's like, you know, if you're putting it down to so everybody presses like, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong line. You got it. If you want to have a conversation, yeah, if you want to have a conversation or a civil discourse, I am all about that all day long. Right. If you're going to shoot from the hip and recoil back into the cave, I have no time for that. No. A conversation, I'm willing to have conversation, of course, because I'll probably learn some things I didn't know. Yeah. And I always appreciate that. Um. But being okay with the family not being there with their pom-poms is really difficult for a lot of people. Or the members of the church saying, oh, did you see what they put on Instagram or TikTok? Did you see that? We have to be okay. And with age, we do become okay. Because if at the end of today, I went back to Facebook and I had, you know, six friends left on Facebook and they're all the people that I love anyway, okay, okay. They're all the people that I love anyway and who love me anyway. And we're not always going to agree. And that's okay. We're not supposed to. Exactly. I think if we're, if wisdom <clears throat> is, we're not supposed to agree. Not everybody's supposed to like what I say. I'm not supposed to have all the answers, but I will find the answers as I go or not. Yes. And if wisdom is... Life is hard. Life is confusing. Life is complicated. Life is the biggest surprise still, always. Yes. And people surprise the shit out of me all day long. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's wisdom is knowing everything is one moment to the next. Yes. It really just is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, God bless our psyches when we think our parents are going to live forever. Our kids are going to live forever. We don't have to worry about disease if it's not around us. Thank God it's in somebody else's home or not ours. Mm -hmm. Or how are we going to deal with it? What is it? I mean, it's not supposed to touch me. Am I cursed if something happens to me? Or, you know, I didn't get my way. Am I denied? It's, it's like, this is just life. Mm-hmm. And right. sometimes we just take it too personal. Well, there you go. There you go. That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but things like what's happened in Texas, that's personal. Mm -hmm. Or just down the road from me in Oxford. Exactly. Well, Sandy Hook, my family. I mean, I called thinking my nieces and nephews were in that school. And they changed that year. And I didn't know it, but they were in that school. Yes. And all I could say is, are our children there? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's... it's. Um... I was reading something the other day about the number of children in the foster care system in the United States. And that there are so many children now waiting to be adopted. Not babies or infants. That's a whole other show. But... 
children waiting to be adopted that they are actually uh, sleeping in hospitals, right? There are hospital wards that are full of children that don't have a home. Right. We can do better with that. We can do better with that. We can do better with, you know, why some of our elderly people don't even get a decent one meal every day. We can do better than that. Right. We can do better. And when the prayer meets the road, that's when stuff happens. And we don't always have to agree. We shouldn't always agree because if we do, then we, we don't receive any new information. Exactly. Um, we don't grow exactly. without the rub, right? Right. You know, the, the, the most important thing to me as a child was literally when my grandmother and grandfather took us out to certain events, brought us to culture, brought us to things that were not in our house. My mother and father did, but they were home taking care of the other babies. My grandmother and grandfather did that. Mm -hmm. They took us to places that were different. Yes. And that to me is developing a sophistication. Yes. To know that things are different and because they're different, they don't have to be dangerous. Right. And different can be very, very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it comes from another mindset. It comes yeah. from a different um, culture. Mm -hmm. it, you know, one of the things is is that that place inside me is I need to know more about what I know less about. Mm -hmm. And it's really how big our planet is. Yes. You know, a couple of years ago, Lily, you were there with me. We were in Ireland. And Lily, Lily's you... out there. Yeah. And I guess it was three years ago. And we were in Killarney one evening. And I like the way you say it, Killarney. We were in Killarney one evening. And uh, we were walking down <clears throat> beautiful Killarney. It's a marvelous little village or large village. And there was a bard who was singing, right? So he was a lyrical poet singing his bardic song. And as I was walking by, he looked at me and he said, are you an American rebel? <laughs> and Todd looked at me, he kind of grinned and he said, oh, if he only knew. And I looked at him and I said, and why do you ask? He said, because you look like, you know, kind of a hippie sort of American rebel. I said, well, I've been called a rebel. I'm definitely an, an American and I can be a hippie. And he started singing a song. And as he sang this song, a crowd gathered from, of people from all over the world. And the song he sang, I will never forget it. The lyrics were, Americans love their guns more than they love their babies. Oh my God. Americans love their guns more than they love their elders. And he went on and on, and the crowd really began to grow. And as, you know, one of the co-facilitators of this trip with Amantha Murphy, I waited for him to finish with his bardic song. And I looked out at this sea of faces from people around the world, and I, I said to him, you're wrong you are wrong. Not all Americans love their guns more than babies. And, you know, I, I had one of my moments. You would say you're right. preaching. I, right. I preached. Right. But I will never forget the sadness in my soul that that was a perception that he was willing, that he had. Right. That others were listening to and felt was the truth. And for the first time, I was embarrassed to be an American. Right. And I've been with ugly American travelers, trust me, but this was something altogether different. Right. And that was the other reason this morning. I, I thought to myself, you know what? 
that bard is probably in Killarney or wherever he's traveled to around Ireland in this moment, wondering, what. so what's that American rebel doing about this? The right. one who stood up and said, what you're saying is not true. Right. Well, she's still telling the truth. It's not true. It doesn't have to be true. It doesn't. And Laura saying, preach it, girl. And Lily <laughs> saying, Dana sure did. I did. Yeah. And we can say a whole lot of stuff, but it's more important when we do. And I came back from that trip. And realized that that was one of the most humbling experiences of my life, but it gave me the wisdom to understand that what we have been fed about America being the greatest country on earth and that everyone shares that opinion is a bunch of bullshit. Exactly. That was tremendously humbling and heartbreaking for me. Yeah. Because it also brought you information on how we're seen. Yeah. Truly seen. Exactly. And we have no idea what we're really seen as or what we're showing ourselves to be. Yeah. That was very I know living in Europe was mind-boggling for me as an American to see we as Americans don't get the news that Europe gets. Mm -hmm. We as Americans don't get told about America the way Europeans get told about us, Mm -hmm. about what is happening in America. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's shocking how little we know about really what's going on that the rest of the world is sharp as a tack about. Mm -hmm. We are kept in the dark. Yes. It's, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. It keeps us humble. It's kept me humble. A lot of things in my life have kept me humble and there's a lot (laughs) of wisdom that come. Wisdom comes from those times that would bring us to our knees and those times that make us eat humble pie. Absolutely. I would hope. You know, and I I, I say that from that place of how do we acquire? Because let's put it this way, too. This This is one of those days where both sides of the coin is on the table. It's not either or. Mm hmm There's a lot of people out there that are not humble at all about what humble, what today is. They're using it as a platform. Right. There's a lot of people out here that are shocked and will never recover. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that are taking advantage of this for either their greater good or taking advantage to make the world a greater place. Mm-hmm. But what I'm watching in some way as this is an opportunity for us to realize we've gone crazy. Mm -hmm. We've gone crazy. Something has tilted. Mm -hmm. Was it like this in the Wild West? I mean, was it, this was, this is Genghis Khan. I mean, have we always been a world that is just annihilated no matter what. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, unfortunately, we have been. Yeah. Each war has, you know, slaughtered children. Right now in the Ukraine, Putin's attacking the hospitals and the schools. Right. There's no dignity to that war. No. And it's far enough away that, you know, it's far enough away. And this isn't our home, but the children over there are hungry and dying and splattered and there's a real war going on. Mm-hmm. And some of it We're is seen insane. and some of it is unseen. Exactly. And that's that, that saying, keep the faith, shine the light. Yeah, do that. Keep the faith, shine the light, and have conversations. Yes. If, go vote. Go vote. Go volunteer somewhere. There are so many ways that the goodness challenges the darkness. And sometimes it's just be good to your own family. 
Walk right. away from a toxic family. Be good to yourself. Right. Go volunteer at the Humane Society. Right. Whatever that is, whatever it happens to be, it's time for us to tip the scales back. Yes. Toward it's the time light. To do something kind. Yes. Yes, and I there mean, are so many ways that's to what do I'm it. Hearing you say, do yes. something bold, do something kind, but just don't sit back and go, "Oh my." Here we are again. Oh Lord. No, go do yeah. something good. Yeah. Bring goodness into the world in small ways, in big ways. If you're not somebody who can, you know, stand up like I do or like you do, that's okay. There are lots of ways to do good things. Right. Lots of ways to do good things. Sometimes it's just checking in on your neighbor. Hey, you okay? Right. Talking to, you know, your own nieces and nephews who are in elementary school or middle school and say, hey, are you okay? You know, what are you thinking about what happened? How can I help well, you? You know, I did that today. I reached out to my niece and I needed <clears throat> to know, how are you telling your children about this? Yes. What are you saying? Right. I, you go to school with your children, your children in school, you go to work at school. How are you doing this? Yes. And just before, I mean, she called me, you know, literally a half hour before our show, and we had to talk. And I am so good in my heart to hear how sane she is with it. Yes. And it's, it's, there's nothing I can say other than, thank God these children have a, a person who cares about their sanity, not the sensationalism of anything. That's right. Laura Smith is saying, God is busy. Help him, her out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're the only hands right here on, here on Terra Firma. It's so That's good true. to have you in the chat room tonight, Laura. Yes. Yes. So get, you know, whatever it happens to be. You know what? If your kids are in school, send their teacher a nice note. If your kids really? aren't in school, send a note to the faculty of a local school and say, I appreciate you. I, you couldn't pay me enough to be a school teacher. No. For a one lot of, of things, reasons. Yeah, one of the things when I said, how are you, you know, dealing with this with your children? And she goes, my children have been doing practicing for three years on how to stay safe in school from guns. Oh or when somebody's not, you know, when there's an unsafe person on the property. And I thought, oh, my God, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. That that is a routine now. We used to do fire drills. We used to get under the 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 desk for the H bomb yeah. in the fifties, which would have been, you know, it was a nice gesture and it gave you three and a half seconds to think you were safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they drill for if there's a a, a a a gunman or an unsafe person. This is what they are trained to do now. So this is in their psyche. It's in their protocol. It's in their routine to go to school. Yeah. I am shocked. Mm -hmm. I'm sad. I'm angry. I'm hurt. I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. And they're still trying to learn and trying to study. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the undercurrent of anxiety or terror or what that does to a nervous system sleep deprivation i mean I, what was my biggest problem in school you know i was dyslexic not whether we were going to get shot right right it's a very it's it's a crueler world than i ever expected from a generation that really wanted peace mm-hmm Something's bizarre. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> wisdom tells us that every ounce of our light, every ounce of our love counts. Every whether ounce. we And, you know, Mother Teresa said, uh, do everything with love, even the small acts. Do them with love. They don't have to be big. Right. Do the small acts with love as well. Do everything with love. Wash one your dishes. That she said, yeah, one of the things that she said was touch the children. If you're going to do anything, touch them. Yes. Touch them. They need to know they're touchable. They mm -hmm. need to feel the warmth of the hand. Yes. And and it's it is. It's like 
we're starved for touch. Mm -hmm. Yes, what's going on is very, it's multi-layered. Yeah, it's big. But there's a, there is a darkness that has crept in. And um, we all have a choice now. Just so that you know, I have had the most, you know, during 9-11, the onslaught of 9-11, um, there are these eggs out there in our society, and I don't know how to describe it any other way, but they, years ago, back in, uh, you know, 2000, so it would have been uh, 1999, 98, they have these eggs that are displayed all around the, the world, I think, to pick up the biofeedback of the subconscious of humanity. And literally these, these whatever they're called, they're called eggs, I don't know how they work, pick up the subconscious biofeedback and can tell when an anxiety starts in the subconscious. Just like when animals with a tsunami, mm -hmm. the animals know to run before mm -hmm. the tsunami comes. Mm -hmm. And these eggs can't say what's going to happen, but they say that the subconscious is picking up something. And then 9-11 happened and everybody then, oh, there it is. And the, the trauma. Mm -hmm releases because mm -hmm. okay whatever happened happened mm -hmm. monday morning i woke up with such anxiety in my guts that i even said to bobby I, this not, this is not something's happening something's out there mm -hmm. you know it's like uh, obi-wan kenobi there's a disturbance in the force you you and i talked about that <clears throat> exactly yeah and I had a client and I thought, whoa, okay, it's her. And then it was, I finished her and it's like, no, it's not. It's like, there's something else. It's like, there was a rumbling in my gut mm -hmm. that I could feel the anxiety. Mm -hmm. And even the client was like, well, I'm having dreams. I'm being chased. I mean, there's, there's, and it's like, so I want everybody to know that our subconscious picks this up. Mm -hmm. Be aware of your dreams. Mm -hmm. Be aware of your nervous system. Be aware of your anxiety. Mm -hmm. I I actually, on Monday, I came home and I told about I, I'm going to have to take an anti-anxiety pill. It's like it, it, it was a slow, boiling experience inside me. Wow. It was not an anxiety attack. It was a building of feeling the suspense. Mm -hmm. And I kept tracking it with Bobby and tracking it. And it's like, this thing is gurgling inside me. This mm -hmm. is not what I, I mean. And so the sad news is my body records this. Mm -hmm. It registers it. Mm -hmm. The sadder news is I wish I knew what it was feeling. And I could be the voice of this, like in Tom Cruise's movie way back when, you know, there's somebody's thinking of doing something. Let's stop them. Yeah. If there's anything we're going to do with all this phenomena out here, I wish we could do that. Mm -hmm. That we could be the intervention to the inside, the, the insanity, rather than the invention of it. Exactly. Exactly. So, well, as we wrap up tonight, <clears throat> thank you all for joining us tonight. And, you know, put your love into action, put your light into action, whether it's through your mouth, calling whomever. Um, that you can reach out to wherever you happen to live, or even for yourself if you're traumatized by, you know, we've had one hell of a last few years here on Grandmother Earth. Take good right. care of you. Right. And, and be and, brave. And I, and I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Janice is saying you're helping us to be brave tonight. And I'm saying you are brave, Janice. We can all be brave. And it doesn't have to be, you know gigantic shows of bravery, but one act of courage. Right. It all counts. And that and that you can say what it is to someone who will carry your voice. Yes. You don't have to be on the front line, but you can literally let somebody know, you need to know this is what my voice is. Yes. So. Yes. God bless the voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. And in the in the generosity from all of us, blessings to all of those families out there. And whatever we can do to help them, may we find our way. Blessings be everyone. Good, Good night. night. Good night, Tina. Good night, Sand.